I'm Lois Donnelly interviewing Professor Lynn Segal on the 14th of March 2022 over Zoom um, and we're discussing their life and career in the context of feminism and its history within psychology. Um, so first of all then could you tell me a bit about yourself um, uh, maybe a bit in terms of kind of the trajectory of your career and the topics of your work that sort of thing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, nice to uh, meet you, Lois. Um, well, I come from Sydney and um, I grew up in the 50s and went to university in the 60s. And like I think many women who study psychology and nowadays it's overwhelmingly women, I think, studying psychology, I noticed a change throughout my teaching career. I guess I studied psychology in order to understand people more, which uh, proved to be rather frustrating back in the 60s because uh, we mainly seemed to be running rats through mazes. And as I've written elsewhere, this didn't actually even tell us anything about rats and their habitat. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, for some reason, I always seemed to do quite well in psychology, partly because I was criticizing it all. And, uh, <laughs> And then that became uh, a part of my career. My career began as a sort of quite fierce criticism of the uh, then discipline of psychology, which was overwhelmingly behavioristic, of course, ever since um, uh, Watson uh, introduces uh, behaviorism and stimulus response theory into psychology. And, you know, what I always thought from the very beginning of my studies in psychology is this wasn't what I wanted to study, although we did have, um, we studied abnormal psychology, which also seemed a rather odd thing to be uh, uh, studying, but uh, we did have one person teaching us about Freud, and I always found that more interesting. So, so I just began my career as a student of psychology in Sydney, Australia, and uh, I began as a very critical crit critic of uh, the discipline I was studying. Yeah, that's so interesting. So then did that kind of um, path of critique kind of continue on for you through your, through your career? Well, yes. I mean, it nearly ended my career, of course. My uh, PhD... Uh, was called Conceptual Confusions uh, in Experimental Psychology, which comes from um, the uh, closing words of Wittgenstein's Tractitus saying, um, psychology is a discipline of uh, experimental methods and conceptual confusions, which is, I thought, yeah, that's right. So what you can tell from that um, uh, PhD was that my main friends and contacts were actually philosophers. So I was busy reading various philosophers, British and Canadian philosophers, saying that um, psychologists really don't know what they're doing. <laughs> they think they're, they're measuring physical responses and learning something about human behavior, but actually they're learning nothing about human behavior because the first thing to know about human behavior is that it's rule bound or else dissident for certain rules. And you don't even understand what a person is doing outside of um, social and linguistic contexts. And I thought, yes, that's right. So, um, so that's what I did my uh, PhD in without a supervisor at all. And oh. it was marked by um, someone called Rose Boom in uh, Canada, who I decided might pass it. And then um, Sigmund Koch in, um, um, I think in Texas. Anyway, these were incredibly eminent people, you know, heading up the major journals in psychology. And um, uh, so I just, there was no interview for the doctorate. I, I know from, uh, I think from Koch, there was just a telegram, award degree immediately. <laughs> so then I had my degree. I had a doctorate from these eminent people approving it, but um, I couldn't get a job in psychology because it, what I was doing in terms of a theoretical critique of behaviorism was not seen as psychology. We should be in the laboratory running rats through mazes and seeing how long it took them to pick up their little bit of cheese or whatever. 
or there were also perceptual experiments we could do, or there was something called group psychology that we studied, um, <clears throat> which was nothing to do with actual social groups, but of course, laboratory groups where uh, you know, <laughs> we studied things called conformity group influence, where you probably know it. They show you two lines and one line is longer than the other. And, and they have your, um, the experimenter has all his stooges insisting that the shorter line is longer and they see whether they can persuade you this is the case. So again, we never, we never got outside the laboratory to know what was going on in the world, which was the reason that I think many people like me wanted to study psychology. So I had my, I had my license to teach, but no one in Sydney was going to employ me. So uh, that led me to um, emigrate to Britain, where in the, so I got my degree in 69, mm -hmm. and I came to Britain in um, at the end of 1970, where there was a large expansion of universities in the UK. Mm -hmm. And um, Basically, you could just walk into anything once you had a PhD. And, and I, I applied for three jobs, I think, and got them all. And I took the one nearest at Enfield College of Technology because I, I at this time, I, I was always somehow wanting to be politically engaged. That was my mm. primary concern rather than to be an academic. So <clears throat> although I think I did get offered a job at Imperial College. I, I liked the idea of um, being at a technical college. So that's where I went and that's where I stayed for 29 years. I remember um, the uh, nice journalist, Melissa Ben was describing what happened to certain uh, British feminists. And she said, um, well, many of them climbed the greasy pole of academia. And uh, I, and I wrote to her later, I said, well, I didn't really climb any pole. What happened was this greasy pole with me on it at Enfield College of Technology, then became Middlesex University. And then it be, no, became Middlesex Polytechnic, I'm sorry. Enfield College of Technology became Middlesex Polytechnic and then it became Middlesex University. So I was there for 30 years in the pole, <laughs> pulled me up as I just Nothing stayed on. Really involved in, community politics and feminist activities and so on. Yeah, that, that's so interesting. And so I suppose there's a bit of less of that barrier in, in Britain then to, to your work, maybe? Absolutely. Well, you see, uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we think of the 1960s as uh, the radical decade, but actually I think in universities and particularly for women, but also uh, for black people and uh, other um, minorities. It was the 1970s that was really um, enabling people to um, be more creative within academia. And, and really we could do what we wanted. So <laughs> I was officially teaching social psychology, but what I was able to teach were just all the things I was interested in, you know, around gender and the exclusion from women, from traditional mainstream psychology experiments, mm. where you uh, didn't notice gender and you didn't notice class and you didn't notice race. And uh, so these were all the things I taught. And uh, it was very interesting. I remember one year at the exam board, by this time we probably were, I don't know if we were Middlesex Polytechnic or Middlesex University. I was there for 30 years. One person said, this isn't um, social psychology, this is um, about social issues. So I changed the name of my course to psychology and social issues <laughs> and uh, continued teaching that, um, which was very largely a critique of psychology for not properly engaging with these social issues. Mm. You know, and I've been reading people like Stuart Hall and Fanon, as well as, of course, all the emerging psychologists uh, like um, <clears throat> Janet Sayers or, you know, critiquing biological reductionism. We'd read um, Anna um, Fausto Sterling and, you know, all the, mm -hmm. all the sort of cutting edge, more critical writers of the day. Plenty of people 
for us to be reading and teaching. And of course, students were very interested <laughs> on the whole uh, in getting lectures that seemed relevant to them rather than uh, what I'd been taught around these poor mats, rats in their mazes or uh, strange little perceptual experiments or conformity activity in the site in the experimental laboratory. So it, it was a great time really for the emergence of um, creativity in academia, a time which sadly has largely passed, you know, as, as universities have got so much more commodified in recent times. And it was, I think, probably particularly nice in the polytechnics where there was slightly less pressure on us. Obviously we didn't have, you know, there wasn't pressure on us to publish. And you know, in fact, the strange thing was I was publishing because I was writing about feminism and psychology and local politics and so on. But most people then were not publishing. And so I was also strangely able to <laughs> rise within the discipline, despite being such an undisciplined daughter within psychology. Yeah, so a bit of kind of both there almost, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. So um, at what stage then did kind of feminism start kind of appearing to you or kind of um, when you started identifying with, with, with feminism maybe? Well, really, it was as soon, I started identifying with feminism as soon as I arrived in the UK. And that was because um, I was very quickly a single mother with a young baby. And um, we were setting up nurseries so that, uh, uh, you know, we could collective nurseries. Actually, I worked at a, a, a local nursery one day a week, one that, you know, local mothers had set up. But also, um, you know, this, the story you hear about 70s feminism is that we were very anti-motherhood, whereas the reality is many um, people who became feminists in the 1970s, such as Mika Nava and Sue O'Sullivan and soon Sheila Rowbottom, uh, were in fact mothers. <laughs> Sheila's written that mothers were the sort of heroines of women's liberation, a bit like the workers for Marxists. And this like, is totally written out of our history um, <clears throat> or denied, you know, so mm. we hear we're anti-feminists. And sadly, I think the situation for mothers has got tougher and tougher today as you know, there's so much individualism at large and the idea that we should in our communities be setting up nurseries and collectively looking after children, asking for money for day centers and nurseries and so on. That, that whole tradition, you know, has got, has sort of almost died away, at least in the inner cities. So, um, yeah, so, you know, being a single mother <clears throat> from late 1969, um, I was always engaged in feminism and setting up uh, a women's center in Islington, going into schools to try and help, um, uh, going to nurseries to help unionize the workers there because care workers then and now are still so exploited, going into schools to talk about feminism and sexism and the world we wanted. And so on. it was an incredibly exciting period as I'm sure any when you've talked to who was a feminist in the 1970s uh, will uh, say to you. Yeah, it's, it sounds amazing. Wish I was there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so how can you kind of talk a bit about how then your work and feminism kind of came together um, and, and how it influenced your work then going kind of forwards? Yes. Well, um, you know, there, I was a socialist feminist. Most feminists were socialists in those days or came out of the left. And, um, and so as we tried to understand, you know, why women were marginalized and secondary and within culture, you know, within politics and so on, we tended to focus in on the family and women's role as carers and mothers within the family and how that um, kept us marginalized, more marginalized within the world at large. And so the very first uh, 
book I edited in 1983 was called What is to be done about the family? And I had various people um, talking about you know, the problems of how um, it, it was the double workloads, it was the care that uh, it was women's role as carers that um, uh, put so many burdens and constraints on women, not that we wanted to give up our caring roles, but we thought there should be more public support for carers on the one hand, but also, of course, we question the biological reductionism <clears throat> around the way in which um, psychology, for instance, looked at sex differences, where you're always looking for the differences and not noticing the overwhelming similarity between men and women. So involving men in childcare, involving men in housework and, and so on was very important for us um, 70s, Feminist, but also tied in them with what I was interested in writing about and talking about. And sexuality, of course, was another key issue that I talked and wrote about um, <clears throat> in terms of um, you know, the idea that women were passive in sex. So, you know, as, as we now uh, uh, read people like Judith Butler writing that it's that basic heterosexual matrix of the active man and the passive woman in mm -hmm. sexuality, that in sexual engagement that uh, we wanted to challenge. So, so um, after I'd edited Is the Future, sorry, after I'd edited What is to be Done About the Family, I then wrote my first single monograph, which was Is the Future Female? Mm -hmm. uh, in which I'm criticizing this separation of the worlds of women and the worlds of men, something which, by the way, evolutionary psychologists like to emphasize, um, and saying, no, the future isn't female, but hopefully feminism will play a significant uh, part in that. And so I engage with, but critique some of the um, cultural feminism, which was insisting more on the differences between men and women, although tending to see them as as culturally acquired. And I was saying it's always more compli complicated than that. So, you know, I would be reading, as I said, people like Stuart Hall and saying that, you know, consciousness comes out of culture, out of language. You can't just talk about the individual. And we know that the individual was the basic unit to study in psychology without thinking of what is behind the formation of individuals, culture, language, um, distinct conditions, you know, so as we know, race and ethnicity and so on would quickly come to play a larger part within feminism. And hopefully I was reflecting that in some of my writing. So after Is the Future Female, I wrote a book on masculinity called Slow Motion, Changing Masculinities, Changing Men, because I didn't like um, what was happening, not so much in psychology, but within feminism, where we seem to be uh, once again, back to these two worlds of men and women with women as virtuous and men as ineluctably aggressive and predatory. And um, I disagreed with that. And I also tried to talk about um, uh, gay and lesbian existence and uh, saying, you no, know, none of, Nobody just fits neatly into the slots in which um, individuals uh, are placed. And then I also wrote a book on sexuality along the same lines, um, straight sex. Um, straight sex, something about the pleasures of heterosexuality. I can't remember what its subtitle is now. Mm -hmm. The politics of sexuality, uh, in which again, I'm, you know, I'm attacking this sort of um, polarized world between men and women and saying there are ways we can come together despite the realities you know of exploitation of women at work of um violence towards women <clears throat> often in domestic situations and in the world at large and so on so so that that's what i begin writing about at the same time as i was always absolutely you know engaged in um local activities i mentioned the women's center but also we had a local paper that I, alternative paper that I was engaged in, the Islington Gutter Press, which I helped to produce. So there was always this wonderful connection between what I was teaching. I mean, wonderful for me to be able to link things up, what I was teaching and my 
political and social engagements. You know, you could really live your politics in those days in uh, ways which could also have its problems. I mean, it sounds <laughs> quite utopian in some ways, but, uh, but as we know, um, you don't just need to be in a laboratory to see how one person influences another in terms of how long the lines are. But, um, you know, some people, for all sorts of reasons, will be able to be more assertive than others. And so the tensions mm -hmm. within feminism around the power relations between women kept coming more and more to the fore. Uh, and by the close of the 70s, that was um, very evident, you know, and evident in our magazines like Spare Rib, for instance, or Red Rag, um, both of which I'd had some connection to. I was on Red Rag for a while and I you know, often wrote for Spare Rib. And, um, you know, feminism was finding it hard to deal with um, different power relations between women because there's, there's different groups are fighting for their own voice and their own presence. And that does create significant tensions, sadly. Yeah, absolutely. I was actually going to ask that in terms of kind of when you were writing, um, uh, when you were writing as a future female, because I think some of those ideas were perhaps, as you kind of touched on, a bit different to other feminist writers at that time. Um, and, and kind of how was that experience for you? What was that like, maybe writing something that was a bit um, different mm -hmm. and, and new in terms of those ideas? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, happily for me, I was always very um, embedded in local politics and, and in um, socialist feminist politics. You know, I was friendly with many, many people who were also <laughs> becoming better known as writers and so on. First of all, Sheila Robottom, who became one of my first good friends and remains a friend today. So there are always a number of us sort of um, both wanting to spread feminist ideas, different ways of understanding um, men and women and relations between men and women, and, and of course, you know, working for um, radical equality between people, trying to improve our communities to make them more women and children friendly. So it's true that I would get criticized, especially as there was a stronger um, radical feminist voice by the close of the 1970s and the particular issues that they were dealing with, which was very much to prioritize men's violence against women. Now, men's violence against women was and remains a huge issue, you know, locally, uh, nationally, and globally. Um, but it wasn't the only issue in relations between men and women. You know, we did have men <laughs> as fathers of our children, as you know, care workers themselves and so on. So, um, so while I would get criticized I, for being soft on men, soft on men, I was once <laughs> at a swimming pool in uh, at my local pool in Highbury and I'm swimming away and suddenly the lifesaver person looking after everyone calls out, are you Lynn Siegel? Yes, I say, you're too soft on men, he says. <laughs> <laughs> and he's studying psychology at Essex. <laughs> oh my God, how bizarre. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> so men were critical of me. Because mm. by this time, you know, there were um, men's groups and so on. There was the journal Achilles Heel, very much uh, wanting to support feminism and reading the most popular feminists. And, and by um, the close of the 70s, some of the most popular feminist voices were Andrea Dawkin and Catherine McKinnon, both in the States, you know, who got more and more single issue um, men's violence against uh, women is the problem and pornography is the cause of men's violence against women. And forget the fact that, um, you know, significant uh, amounts of violence against women were in countries that did not have easy access to pornography and those, you know, many of those people who are often being jailed for rape, given the um, uh, unfairness of our trials, etc., were uh, often um, 
particular man who didn't have particularly much access to pornography compared to other men and so on. So, you know, I was always against um, reductive thinking wherever it was coming from, and mm. uh, whether it was in the left or within feminism and so on. So I did get criticised, but then I always had solid support groups behind me and other people who would agree with me and so on. So, you know, they were just exciting times, as I said. Yeah, definitely. That's that's so interesting. Um, so I suppose moving on, thinking about kind of support groups and and stuff like that, and and you kind of saying that you're uh, quite, you were and are probably quite uh, involved with feminist activism then within your career. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, can you tell me a bit about that, and maybe uh, a bit about your involvement with POWs as well as a feminist organisation? Yes, yes. Well, it's interesting because I. Um... You know, I did always prioritise my community activism and, <clears throat> and um, I suppose, being part of a, the radical movements uh, socially. I would, um, um, I tended not to be at the forefront of um, organising within academia. Mm. Uh, it was more I was organising outside. And um, so... The first I knew about POWs was being approached by others, sometimes in fact by students or indeed uh, doctoral students such as Catherine Johnson, who becomes very involved in POWs and says, well, you must come along and talk about whatever masculinity or violence or... Um, so, I, you know, the interesting thing is because of my political engagements uh, and always wanting to be rooted where I was you know I'm always in frightened of feeling rootless <laughs> I was rooting myself in my in the community politics and um, <clears throat> and and then I would be um, invited um, to do things within power so my as I said I stayed at um, at uh, Enfield into Middlesex for around 30 years and then I only had one other job which is interesting isn't it most people nowadays would have more than two jobs and I had that job because I was invited to apply for um, an anniversary professorship at Birkbeck otherwise I probably wouldn't even have moved and uh, so then um, I was really lucky really lucky because I always thought I wouldn't ever get a job in a mainstream psychology department because I certainly was not publishing in um, psychology journals, although uh, those who'd marked my doctorate had been connected to top psychology journals. That's not where I published. You know, I would much more likely be publishing just in <clears throat> local magazines or journals. I was on Feminist Review, so I'd publish in Feminist Review. I'd mm-hmm. publish <clears throat> at times in... Uh, spare rib while it was still going it closes in the 1980s you know sometimes in new left review and so on but um (laughs) in terms of my journal footprint it was uh, pretty negligible so other other people would approach me I suppose more as a public figure and that's how I got the job at Birkbeck they were celebrating 175 years of Birkbeck as a, um, was called originally a working men's university, a working people's university in um, 1999. And that's when I got the job there. They're about to celebrate their 200 years actually. Oh, wow. And, uh, but they were looking for more of a public intellectual. So I suppose in a way, mm. you know, <clears throat> it's, a, it's an interesting concept, the public intellectual, isn't it? One that's sounds rather grand and certainly rather male as anything uh, <laughs> too public does but you know I, I had a, a certain you know a, a certain presence there you know um, my books would get reviewed in the Guardian for instance yes. or New Statesman and so that gave me a certain um, media clout that meant that I got the job at um, Birkbeck so So, you know, I I think I very much appreciated the work that other women were doing in setting up POWs. And I did speak there many times, but I would never have been one of the organisers of the conference or, you know, I was one um, 
just pleased it was there, very pleased that, you know, what I saw in my career, I think I mentioned was when I began teaching in 1970, I felt there were about equal numbers of men and women studying psychology, but then the big change in academia as more and more people are going to universities is that there's more and more women. And, uh, and by the end of my career, it was so overwhelmingly women who were studying psychology. Um, and I think that's for better or f and for worse because, um, you know, it's because everything now is so career related, instrumentalized, you know, universities being more yeah. modified subjects, you know, must relate to um, uh, output in terms of income earned. And that was, that is such a crazy idea for me, you know, you study for its own sake. And so what we get now, you know, is this terrible attack on the humanities and psychology for me is very much a part of the humanities, placing people in the context and you know, looking at the um, inequalities and uh, uh, difficulties which um, people face within the social world. And <clears throat> of course, psychology, as we know, even today, although it has been altered through the struggles of women and, and, and black people and ethnic minorities within it, it still likes to think of, it still has this science envy, which people like Michael Billig and other people have written about. They still like to think that they're with these hard facts of the brain. So neuropsychology is very, uh, uh, <clears throat> seen as very significant, even though Actually, there's no story about the functioning of the brain except the cultural story we attach to it and, and so on with evolutionary psychology. The pretenses that we've got back to the genes and what they do actually know next to nothing about <laughs> genes and what they do in terms of complex human behavior. Yeah. But psychologists still seem to be rather mystified by what they imagine science to be. And so I've always been someone that trying to say, hang on, <laughs> get back to social reality and all its complexities. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes those complexities, I suppose, are harder to kind of grasp onto um, rather than the genes and the brain, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so, so I suppose kind of how was maybe the involvement with POWs or any other kind of feminist organisation um, was that important kind of during your career and in your work in any way, do you think? It was just very nice to see. And um, because my teaching and writing was always um, <clears throat> quintessentially interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, you might say, drawing on different disciplines. And I think for PALS, that was also the case, you know, I can remember being on platforms with Johnny Lewandowski, who was in politics and other people who were in sociology. So opening out, always this opening out um, psychology to embrace um, intellectual life more generally mm. um, is what I see POWs as representing and, you know, which what I think should be celebrated. Um, and uh, so I did, you know, feel grateful that I had platforms there and it, it probably helped me to be more recognized within psychology <laughs> because actually in 1999, when um, I was asked to apply for the job at Birkbeck, it was because I had been linked to a particular degree there, an MA in gender, culture and society and uh, they had suggested that I apply. And, and that had actually come out of English and Humanities at Birkbeck, which was really more a place where I felt at home. Mm. But anyway, I happen to know, I've been told the story that uh, the vice chancellor, then called the master at Birkbeck, uh, went along to tell people, you know, we're, we're going to appoint these half dozen people or something as a, uh, uh, the public face of Birkbeck. And um, so he went to English, they were very happy to suggest me. And then he went to the psychology department and said, so who would you suggest as a, a public uh, force 
And uh, they were all, oh, I don't know. And, and so he actually said, I've been told, what about Lynn Siegel? I don't know exactly how he knew about me because I think he was a chemist or something. And I say, who? <laughs> we never heard of her. But there was one person there, Stephen Frosch, who'd certainly heard of me because I often shared platforms with him and sometimes at PALS, actually, you know, and nationally and internationally because, of mm. course, you know, international is hugely important. So he said, oh, yes, I know Lynn Siegel. I was at a conference with her in Sydney just recently. You know, she's great. <laughs> and uh, so it was more, you know, I would get more pulled into psychology um, mm. uh, through my writing. So in, I got appointed to be half in psychology and half in English and humanities, which was a wonderful place for me to be. And, and so meeting people like Stephen through Powers, who was doing very similar things to me, slightly more psychoanalytic, but as I say, I've always been interested in Freud and psychoanalysis and mental states and so on, which psychologists are still a bit wary of uh, to this day, <laughs> outside of psychoanalysis. And um, uh, so that was a perfect place for me um, until I actually came up to what was then compulsory retirement age, because I turned 65, I think the year before the law changed around compulsory retirement. And um, but at that time, we were setting up, in, it would have been in 2009, we were setting up psychosocial studies at Birkbeck with Stephen Frosch heading it up. And so Stephen said, oh, well, we have to buy back Lynn. And so psychosocial studies was, again, exactly the home for me. But psychosocial studies is only emerging, really, since it's in the 21st century. And that, that was my home, psychosocial, and remains my home, psychosocial studies, you know, an interest in the psychic and the social and the place of the individual within it. So I feel I've always been lucky in terms of being able to be a part of uh, changes that are happening, but many other people also very much pushing those changes, you know, with the um, uh, with powers, but also the journal feminism and psychology that gets set mm -hmm. up. You know, I often um, I just feel I am slightly on the border, you know, this absolute definite transdisciplinary scholar, you know, transdisciplinary political scholar. And so things like powers are crucial in giving a space to people like me. Mm, yeah, that's really interesting good, and good to know. Yeah, lovely. Um, brilliant. And, and do you think that... Um, Powers has kind of developed over the years and and do you think it should continue to develop along a kind of particular path or anything like that? Right. Well, another thing that's very important about Powers is it's, you know, it's very, it's not just interdisciplinary, but it's very um, international, isn't it? Mm. You know, I've been to conferences in Spain and Portugal and, you know, you're meeting people from <clears throat> everywhere. I suppose that's true of the BPS in general, but I think for women in psychology, you know, we have needed um, together to be promoting our voice of, you know, rethinking gender, you know, rethinking class, rethinking ethnicity, all this endless rethinking, you know, rather than, well, here's the basic facts, you get them through the brain or you get them, you know, through our evolutionary history, you know, all yeah. this, um, to me is sort of silly. It's just plain silly because it's always far too reductive. And so um, the power of women, I suppose um, some people might say that, you know, from the 1990s with um, uh, post-structuralism and, and um, so-called postmodernism, whatever that is, <laughs> building from post-structuralism and the turn to language and, um, mm -hmm questioning of everything now that's where I've always fitted in the questioning of everything the questioning of certainty so that's meant to be the essence of postmodernism I guess the questioning of certainties the the embrace of complexity the embrace of complexity and so um psychology is no one thing and women are no one thing but um mm -hmm. you know that's something which I think powers 
has very much recognized. Um, mm. Yes, it's interesting. <laughs> I can, has there ever been pressure to change um, the psychology of women to, uh, <laughs> I don't think it's necessary actually. I wonder, but uh, you know, there's so much, for instance, dispute around trans issues now and so on. Why women, you know, is this essentializing women? I mean, it seems to me one is always beginning from uh, exploring the complexities of those identifying as women. So I don't see a problem really, but mm. uh, has it ever come up as a problem? In, in POWs? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think POWs is trying to be a bit more kind of openly trans inclusive, I would say, okay. um, yeah. and try and be supportive in that, in that sense. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think that's, we're trying to do a bit more of that, I think. Um, yeah. Because it's a, this pretense, isn't there, that uh, trans women sort of undermine the whole category of women. And yet I think, well, you know, that's really what feminism was doing. We were undermining what was seen as, you know, the essential yeah. nature of women, saying there is no essential nature of women, which doesn't mean that uh, gender and sexual difference isn't still the um, uh, identity that is most you know, given most force within society for better and for worse, and traditionally for women for worse, because it meant restricting women to only certain roles and so on, and, uh, you know, managing to exclude them from uh, public life. Yeah, that's such a good point. Absolutely. Um, yeah, oh, okay. So talking a bit more broadly then in terms of kind of feminism and psychology, um, what impact do you think feminists have made in psychology so far? And what do you think remains maybe to be accomplished? Well, <laughs> I think our battles are eternal, really, aren't they? Um, in that, uh, I think feminism has made a huge difference. You know, I don't think anyone uh, can think that. <laughs> measuring sex differences this is all we need to know about uh, men and women in the world today <laughs> and ignoring all the similarities and only focusing on the differences as was the um, habitual move within uh, psychology and you know that that was mainly criticized to outside psychology wasn't it by um, um, uh, Robert then Ryan Connell in his book on gender and power, or, or as I said, Anne Fausto Sterling, the um, American uh, biologist, feminist biologist, and so on. Um, and so we win certain battles in, you know, talking about the uh, complexity of identities, the instability of identities, the fact that identities never exist outside of. Um, the social domain culture is always there, you know, even affecting the womb, you know, <laughs> whether babies are going to survive birth is very much affected by um, issues of poverty and mm. class, which in interact with issues of race and so on. So that's what we fed in, this notion of the individual, which even social psychology, as I said, was a study of individuals, how one individual affects another individual. And, um, you know, that notion is silly. It's silly. And yet within psychology, they never want to move too far away from it. They want to find ways of thinking that somehow we're born to be, you know, either through our genes um, or, our, yeah, through our genes, our evolutionary history or something in male or female brains uh, that um, are what largely determines our fate. Whereas um, the battle that goes on within psychology is that what largely determines our fate is never any one thing. You know, it's yeah. never any one thing. And, and now, of course, there's a whole issue of um, the environment and women have always been very engaged with thinking about our relationships to the environment because one thing that um, has always been the case, you could go right back to um, um, Susan Griffin writing in the 70s. I tend to always agree with her, but nevertheless, in her Women and Nature, she's saying that um, women like nature, 
that is the physical and <clears throat> the physical and natural world have always been somehow seen as secondary and something for man to use. And so uh, this issue of nature was always crucial um, for feminists in, in rejecting the idea that, you know, women and men are somehow decreed to be certain ways by nature. But now, of course, it, it's all back with quite a new force in terms of um, how we sustain the world and the idea that women have always been the ones or the first in line to try and um, <clears throat> um, care about the world around them and, and the, uh, what we now know to be the deterioration of the world around us, the levels of pollution, the um, uh, um, <clears throat> shrinking of biodiversity, the um, shrinking of forests, the rising sea levels, and how these are something that don't sound like psychology, do they? But, um, you know, psychologists, and particularly, I think, feminists in psychology, but psychologists in general, <clears throat> now need not just to see that as individuals, we're always socially embedded, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, we're not just socially embedded in human relations, we're socially embedded in uh, planetary relations as well. And so we better work out how to preserve the planet. So I imagine that that is going to be one big area for um, uh, powers to be engaged in, in a way that might be slightly new. I don't know what you think about that. Um, you know, um, yeah. as well, eco-socialism and things like that. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I agree, yeah. So, yeah. Well, another reason that that's eco-socialism more environmentalism or sustainability is interesting is because um, some of the voices there, and that probably does go a little back to Susan Griffin, um, <clears throat> tended to make women the natural caretakers of everything, so the natural caretakers of the world. So sometimes there would be an essentialism creeping uh -huh. into um, um, ecology and eco-socialism and so on, environmentalism that um, again, feminists want to say, oh, well, wait a minute, you know, we're all here <laughs> to look after each other and look after the planet. And this is, you know, this is a really challenging thing to be thinking about now and that we know the main cause of um, um, the threats to our environmental uh, ecostructure come from burning coal and oil and so on. and. So how do we actually get um, healthy green alternatives without uh, handing power over to the corporations to only think about how do we increase our profits? And how do we actually relate to the world in a way that uh, helps us uh, create better societies? It takes us right back to William Morris and other people in the 19th century who were actually very concerned about this and pointing out that um, profits in the market, you know, are going to destroy yeah. us all if we allow our cities to uh, destroy the countryside. And, and of course, that is what we've seen with the huge deforestations, mm. deforestation, not just in uh, Brazil, but all sorts of parts, but also here, you know, how we preserve the environment for us, <laughs> for future generations. Yeah, absolutely. And has Powell's done much work on that now? I think they are doing more, aren't they? Yeah, I, I think so. I think people are starting to look a bit more at that. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely an interesting topic, isn't it? Um, yeah. All the other issues, as I said, around uh, motherhood and poverty and uh, exclusion with, you know, the effects of war, the effects of trauma. I mean, these are all things that, if you just focus on the individual, you're not thinking of this wider world yeah. and the destructive forces that we're all going to be facing. Afterwards. Yeah, yeah, that's imp that's important, isn't it? Um, yeah. Okay. So, what what um, advice then might you give to um, feminists or activists um, entering into psychology now? Well, um, my advice would be. Don't ever expect simple 
answers, to always be prepared to embrace uh, complexity, to always see that um, we are never outside of culture, we're never outside of the social. And yet, you know, each individual is unique and we all do have a very particular psychological history that, um, uh, you know, we're probably never going to get to the bottom of understanding, but, um, you know, whichever areas we go in that we want to work in, whether it's more around, um, uh, you know, it might be around education, it might be around uh, so many different things. Always uh, psychologists should be having a lot to say as to you know, what keeps people sane. I mean, that's the other thing we haven't discussed. I, I didn't talk about mental illness. I always spoke, I always wrote, sorry, on and spoke <laughs> on uh, <laughs> mental health and mental illness because, of course, um, the people we were reading back in the 60s when I was a radical student were uh, D. Lang and, um, uh, of course, Fanon, who I mentioned before, who was a psychiatrist. And, um, uh, but what we read about every day actually are rising levels of mental stress, rising levels of depression. And then, you know, we have to relate that to the whole rise of the pharmaceutical industries who, um, you know, dominate so much and are always there with uh, their product to uh, supposedly sort out our uh, mental health problems. When in fact, um, you know, isolation and loneliness are, um, are some of the main causes of people's distress. And so, for instance, I'm now engaged in a project on solitude, solitude and diversity that's headed up by the historian Barbara Taylor. And, uh, and so, you know, everyone can enjoy and cherish their solitude, but we can only enjoy and cherish our solitude if the world outside doesn't feel threatening, you know, we can just yeah. be on our own and doing what we want to, but no, there is a caring world outside. There are people we can relate to. And if there isn't, then you have loneliness. I mean, Donald Winnicott talked about, you know, a child who is lonely, who doesn't feel that there is for him the caring mother, the caring person, the caring planet outside. That is the most desperate and terrible state, barely worth living, you know. And uh, and so that's I think is a very crucial issue. Thinking about isolation, loneliness, and you know we should all be entitled to a healthy solitude. And you can only have a healthy solitude, you know, in a caring world. That's yeah. a crucial psychological issue. Yeah, absolutely. And and that comes into your kind of maybe your most recent book, isn't it? The um... Oh, sorry. Uh, the care manifesto. Yes, yeah. Um, and and kind of everything about that. And do you want to, do you want to tell me briefly about yes, that work? Yes, yes, because I only got up to, um, I just did my first few books. My last few books, <laughs> we could begin with what I wrote about aging when um, uh, I started to become old myself in my late 60s. And the thing about feminism is, you know, we begin with the slogan, the personal is political, but also for socialist feminists, the political is personal. You know, we're not just interested in individuals and, and uh, what they feel they want, but how people are uh, cherished or, or else despised or rendered um, marginalized in the world. So that's what I wrote about when I wrote about aging, the, which was called Out of Time, the pleasures and perils of aging and so it's you know how we don't turn older people into outsiders um, within how we don't feel threatened by aging whatever our age since we're all going to age so so any ageism which is still widespread <coughs> is simply prejudice against ourselves in the everyday we're getting older so that was the sort of thing I tried to saying out of time and then in radical happiness um, um, which was uh, moments of collective joy mm. that again was celebrating that good times are the times we can at least talk about and share with others you know we don't we can certainly enjoy being alone as I said in solitude but but 
but we need to be able to tell that story about ourselves and share the story and share, you know, things that seem mm. good about being alive. And that needs, for that, we need other people. We need those moments of collective joy, regaling each other about what's why life is worth living. And then I actually started a book, which I'm still working on, um, which at the moment I'm calling Lean on Me, not Lean in <laughs> like um, um, neoliberal feminism, Sheryl yeah. Sandberg, just think about yourself. No, not lean in uh, and not just lean out, <laughs> but uh, lean together, act together. So lean on me is let's act together. Um, and I wanted to call it disavowals of dependency. The fact that, you know, masculinity and indeed sort of neoliberalism is all about the individual and how we assert ourselves and benefit ourselves in the world. And, and uh, in fact, we are all dependent, you know, and indeed yeah. those who are uh, richer and more powerful are usually more dependent than anyone else because they're being serviced by any number of people. Anyway, I'm still working on that book now and I don't know exactly what it's gonna be called, but it will be pursuing what, what I suppose now is my general theme in all my writing, which is um, how we need each other. We need yeah. each other and we, <clears throat> we need to think also beyond you know, our own immediate horizons for those who are um, suffering or in trouble elsewhere because you know, the world is so interconnected you know, and it, it will affect us. So the fact that the environmental destruction is hitting the poorer parts of the world, um, Pakistan and India and so on, first of all, also means it will be creating a flow of emigration. It will be, you know, or, or we could think about the situation of COVID, of course. You know, we many of us have hoped that um, post-COVID, we can think about the way in which we're all connected and the fact that we don't just need to get individually vaccinated. We need to see the world as vaccinated or the world as uh, supported in fighting COVID. And if we don't, then of course, you know, viruses do not respect national borders, obviously. And uh, so interconnection, working together, supporting each other, I guess that's what I hope my life and writing has been about. Yeah, amazing. Um, and the yeah, the, the book you're working on sounds great. I look forward to reading it. <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, yeah, oh, thank you for, for yeah, telling, telling me a bit more about that. Um, yeah. I think I've kind of covered all, all the questions that I've got. Do you, is there anything else that I haven't mentioned that, that maybe you'd like to cover? Um, no, no, I, I would just like to think that powers will flourish and that feminism and psychology will flourish, but also that it will always stay open, you know, to be able to embrace whoever wants to engage with it, you know, say, and above all, embrace the complexity of things and the need for the comfort of things and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, brilliant. Uh, okay, so um, just for the record, could you state your um, gender, please? Yes, I've always seen myself as female. Lovely. And I've been treated as female. <laughs> and mm. also your place and date of birth. Yeah, I was born in Sydney on the 29th of March, uh, 1943. So I'm coming up to 80. Lovely. Um, and then also your occupation. In a few years. <laughs> uh, well, um, I would say I'm a um, psychologist and a writer uh, and a political activist. Mm. As long as I can be, <laughs> with the support of others. <laughs>